Do you think the underlying reason for cancel culture is that we are so connected through technology, but so isolated just wanting to be heard? What do you think is the deepest reason? Well, I don't think that the underlying reason is for cancel culture is that we are so connected through technology. I think it would be happening anyways. I think it's possible that technology facilitates the kind of bullying that cancel culture essentially represents by making it somewhat easier and also making it less likely that the people who are doing it are going to be held responsible for their actions. But I don't think it's the fact that we're connected through technology, and I'm presuming the questioner means modern technologies, such as those that underlie the use of social media rather than, you know, books and, and, and print and, and TV and all those technologies that we've had for at least some time. Um, the deepest reason for cancel culture, well, I would say there's two deep reasons. One is it's a form of bullying, and it might even be a female-specific form of bullying or female, uh, uh, not specific, that's wrong. It's the form of bullying that goes after reputations, essentially, and that's a feminine form of bullying because the feminine use of aggression tends to be reputation destruction and cancel culture is a manifestation of that. And I don't know to what degree cancel culture and its assorted manifestations are a manifestation of the feminine tendency to destroy reputations, but it looks like, it looks to me like there's something to that. So we don't know, right? We don't know how female antisocial behavior proclivities are going to manifest themselves in the political realm, but we'd be foolish to think that they won't because they certainly manifested themselves in, you know, male antisocial tendencies certainly manifested themselves in the male political realm. So why would we expect anything different on the female side? Um, in any case, no, I think the reason that cancel culture exists is, well, that there's this bullying issue, but there's an, another deep reason, which is that the philosophy upon which cancel culture rests is the philosophy that states that the fundamental motivating drive and the organizing principle of Western culture is power. And power is something like the ability to use force to compel others to act against their own best interests or to act against what they would freely choose. So it's the antithesis of informed negotiation, right? If I have power over you, that means I can force you to do my will rather than negotiate with you to do our will or to allow you or to facilitate you using your will. So that's how I'm going to use power in this discussion. And this culture war we're in is fought against uh, the philosophy that presumes that it's power of that sort that structures our social relations. Now, if you believe that, and you shouldn't, because it's nonsense, it's, it's the anti-truth, because that isn't what structures our social relations, it's an aberration upon what structures our social relations. Well, then you believe that people, individuals are nothing but the mouthpiece of their group and their, their group identity is beneficial to them because it allows for their expression, the expression of their power and for the maintenance of their status and all of that. If you believe that, then there's no dialogue between people. There's only power struggle between groups. And so you don't give someone who isn't in your group the opportunity to speak or to exist for that matter. Why would you? Because they're just doing their power thing and you're doing your power thing and it's, it's a battle of all against all and you want your power identity to win. So cancel culture is the logical outcome of that reasoning. Why would you, you don't engage with your opponents because there's no you to engage, there's no individual, there's just the group identity expressed in power. So you can't have a rational discussion, modify your axioms and come to a negotiated settlement. That That's all part of the enlightenment hypocrisy or even deeper than that, the Judeo-Christian hyp hypocrisy. Now, I take umbrage to that, let's say, because I don't believe that these principles are even Western in their derivation. I believe they're human universal in their derivation. 
And so, I'm, unless the people who are criticizing Western culture want to attribute to Western culture only the best of human culture, because that's what this is, which I think is something they would have a hard time swallowing. Um, I don't believe the best in human culture has manifested itself as the drive to power. I think that's an appalling philosophy. I think the only people who believe that are those who use power to negotiate their own social relations and who wish they had the power to negotiate the broader social contract. So I think the hypothesis that power is the fundamental motivation is an unconscious confession on the part of its professors. And I think all of their actions indicate precisely that. So you know who you're dealing with when you hear someone who makes that claim. They're either deeply cynical or they're narcissistic or they're Machiavellian or, and, and they believe that's how everyone else is. I think that comes, I think that's absolutely clear. The woke phenomena is an index of the vast longing slash hunger of our moment. I mean, the, if you take it at face value, well then you get to put yourself on the side of the heroes that are fighting against those who oppress people on the basis of arbitrary characteristics like their race. And so that certainly accounts for some of the attraction on the positive side. I mean, the negative side is, well, the, the opportunity to tear things down for the sake of tearing them down in the name of some higher moral virtue that just covers the real motivation, which is to tear things down because you're envious. But, you know, to give the devil his due, well, there's something to be said for working, identifying with a movement that purports to be serving the interests of the poor and the dispossessed and, and those who are um, prejudiced against and, and to take to task those who are perpetrators of such things. And so I see that as part of a religious impulse to do the good, but it's so incomplete and it, it's so um, it's so dangerous in its incompleteness because, well, partly because it provides a say a too convenient enemy and partly because it does dispense with the richness of the past and well and then it brings with it in its in its in its wake let's say all sorts of ideas that are entirely counterproductive um, i mean it, it contains within it a fundamental critique of the idea of free market economies for example which to me is just a disaster it just from a computational perspective we can't do with central planning what the market can do with computation because it's distributed and it relies on the choices of everyone. It's a much more effective computational system. But we seem to have done a pretty bad job of defending it.